thanks so much for coming to the event this morning. I think it's a really important subject that we're kind of tackling this morning. Um, thank you so much to our celebrities that are will willing to talk about their experiences on social media. Um, we're going to be keeping it quite raw, so I do apologise in advance if anyone's back offended by any of the language they hear today. Um, but I think it's really important that we tackle the subject head on. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through the agenda and the times of everything. Um, also, if anyone wants a comfort break, the toilets are just out that way to the left. So Tom Reardon will be speaking in the next five minutes. So he's the head of Leeds City Council. He'll be giving us a quick overview of the safeguarding issues in Leeds and what the council is doing to address them. We've then got Zara Holland talking about her experiences on social media, um, talking about kind of what she's come into contact with, um, followed by Sophie, um, again the same. Um, and I also just want to say thank you again because obviously it's quite a serious issue that we're tackling and I do appreciate you bringing your kind of personal experiences into it. Um, we've then got Emma Kenny, who's a child psychologist, t telling us about the impact on a child and how that can affect their behaviour within school and other bits. Um, and then we've got Rob, um, who works at Web Anywhere. He'll be talking about what schools can do in terms of security with safeguarding. Um, and he'll also be giving us a quick update on GPRS. Is that right? Um, so um, I hope you enjoy everything. Um, any questions, please feel free to ask the guys. We'll do a quick five minute Q&A um, after all of their talk. So yeah, please enjoy. I'll just pass you over to Tom now. Thanks, Claire. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> we get less rain than Paris, honestly. <laughs> um, so sorry about the weather. Um, and uh, I, I'm the Chief Executive of Leeds City Council. I'm delighted to see so many people here. Um, some of you from Leeds and Yorkshire, but some from further afield. Um, Leeds is a great city. It's the third biggest city in the country. We've got two fantastic new shopping centres, Trinity and Victoria Gay. One won the best shopping centre in the world, so take a look. Um, we've got a brilliant new music arena, so good that Bruce Springsteen has to open it. Um, with, the, uh, with the genius of local government, we gave him a parking ticket. <laughs> so uh, we got in the world news. That was an interesting conversation with the leader of the council um, at the time. But um, Leeds is a great city and there are other great cities represented here today. So really good to see you. We want to be a, a child friendly city and children are at the heart of what we're trying to achieve in Leeds. We put them um, right front and centre in terms of the way we do business. So for example, we have a, a children's mayor. So we have you know, the Lord Mayor with the chains and the, um, the regalia, or we have a sort of mini-me version of the Lord Mayor. Every year we do a big competition um, across Leeds. And they put forward their manifestos. And um, this year, a, a girl called Isla um, from uh, Gildersum put forward her manifesto, which was kindness costs nothing, let's stop bullying in Leeds. And, you know, a really inspirational idea. And so, really relevant to today as well. And one of the things that Isla put in her manifesto was the issue of cyberbullying and real concerns that our young people in Leeds have about the impact of social media, particularly on young girls and um, the pressure that it puts on them to, um, to, to be a certain person. And when, when I'm a different generation, as you can see, um, and when, when I talk to my kids, they find it in, almost impossible to understand that you didn't have a mobile phone when you were growing up and the internet didn't exist. Um, you didn't have email. It seems like when I talk to my parents about you know, the first time they ate a banana or, you know, it, uh, the first time colour TV came on and things like that. But it is so different. And, um, you know, when we were growing up, I do feel that whatever problems you had outside your house and outside school, when you went home and you shut the door, that did actually mean that you, were, you had a bit of a safe haven. And these days, with mobile phones and smartphones, you know, actually, even if the kids are looking at it, in their heads they know that stuff's going on still, people are still talking. So it's almost like that safe haven is lost sometimes. And 
it puts that extra bit of pressure. You know, young girls in particular, you know, posting a photograph on, uh, on Instagram, how many likes are they going to get? You know, are they going to get some nice comments? Are they going to be a bit deflated if they don't get too many? You know, those issues are really are, are happening. They're here, in, they're, they're here and now, if you like. And how can we make sure that in a city like Leeds and in the places you're in, the schools you, you lead, we get to a point where actually it is safe to go online. It is healthy conversation that's happening. You know, it is good, a, a positive, if you like, that young people are communicating on social media. The other element to it that I think is really important is that our kids are probably more savvy than us a lot of the time. And I think the way tech is taught now in schools you know, it's, it's a real issue about how you make it exciting to uh, kids and interesting because if we're not careful, it becomes the most boring bit of the school curriculum. And actually, we need to make it interesting and exciting because digital and tech skills are going to be vital to almost every industry going forward. So we need to think about how we as, you know, if you're a head teacher or you're a teacher, you know, you need to be more informed, you need to be credible when you're talking to kids because they know more, as much or more as we do. And so to persuade them, I think we've got to have that on our agenda as well. So events like today are really, really good and really important in that respect. The issue of um, trolling and, you know, the negative of social media in terms of, you know, that, that bullying and everything else you're going to hear about today, and it is horrendous what people have had to put up with, I think particularly the misogyny that you get online. I, I'm in a position of authority in, a, in the city and I, you know, trying to be positive. I was an early adopter on Twitter, so I've got lots of um, followers on Twitter. Barack Obama follows me on Twitter and everyone thinks it's I'm really, really interesting, but actually it was just I was really early in the Obama campaign. I started following him and they were following people back at the start. Um, but my that's one a nice one for my kids to know. But um, the, um, the I, I have to put up with a, a lot of abuse and you know people getting really concerned. But in a way, you know, I, I see some of that as part of the public accountability that you have in positions of authority like mine. I'm funded by the taxpayer. I'm responsible for services. But there's a line, isn't there? And it's a question of where is that line and how do you make sure that people don't cross it? And if they do, you have recourse to that. Because at the moment, it feels like that's all wrong. And you'll, as I say, you'll hear more from our celebrities today about that. But I think that the tech companies, governments, you know, all of us have to try and move on from where we are at the moment. I'll end on a positive because we have um, really good material in Leeds that you can we could share with you there's a there's a website called MindMate um, that I mentioned that um, is really worth a look and get talks to children about their mental health issues we're the only part of the country with a joint strategy with the NHS and the council for children's mental health and it includes a whole range of issues that like events like this training for parents and head teachers about mental health issues in the city um, trying to get kids to talk about their mental health a bit more, not feel like it's stigmatised, trying to help kids with anxiety issues, etc. So there's lots of good work going on. Social media is quite transformational in a positive way. You know, the way that grandparents across the world can talk to the grandchildren these days, you know, is really positive. The way you can get information out quickly, the things you can learn. So there's a big positive to this agenda that we've got to latch onto and keep hold of. But equally, there are real risks, and we've all got to know more um, about what's happening. And that's why, you know, I really commend Claire for hosting this event today. And um, you know, I hope you have a really, really interesting day. And um, hopefully, it'll stop raining and it won't start snowing. I don't think it's going to snow um, until later in the uh, in the day today. So, uh, but the forecast was wrong last week, and as a result. I was absolutely annihilated on social media. <laughs> so there you go. Um, but uh, have a great morning and uh, look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Morning, everyone. 
Um, well, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Zara Holland. Um, I'm from Hull, so Northern Girl. <laughs> I have two ladies fashion boutiques. Uh, most of you might know me from uh, ITV show Love Island, which was on two years ago. Um, at the time, I was the current Miss Great Britain when I went in. Um, and going into a show like that from a normal girl who left school with not many GCSEs because I didn't really like school, to tell you the truth. Sorry, all you had so much. <coughs> and then coming out of a show and having, I think when I went in, I had something like 2,000 followers on Instagram. I came out with over 100,000 followers on Instagram. And when I say horrendous comments, I mean threatening, they wanted to kill me, people were going to come to my house, they will stab me, they will wait for me outside of work. Um, and today it's a really big thing for me to talk about this. Um, I did nothing wrong to anyone. I didn't bully anyone. I didn't um, have an affair with anyone. I was just a normal girl that went on a TV show at 20 years old and as a result of it, um, came out to some really, really terrible comments and how do you cope with it? Um, it, was, it was hard and it's still really, really hard today. Uh, two years on, I've gone back to my normal job with my mum. In Hull, we have, like I said, we've got our two ladies fashion boutiques and uh, in a way you want to get away from it. But I think it needs to be addressed in schools from a young age and before today, um, I went back to my primary school head teacher and said, you know, what is sort of the age that you start teaching kids from? And she said, around year three. And I was like, well, how do you make it interesting? And she does an assembly and she explains it on toothpaste. She says, so kids, if you squeeze the toothpaste, you can't get the toothpaste back in the tube. It's like social media. Once you've said it, you can't get it back. Yes, as we all know. I mean, are we all on social media here? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Is there anybody who isn't? Okay, so there's four, five, five. Like on a percentage, that, that's a lot. Um, so I think we need to make it interesting. We need to address it from a young age. Um, but then on the other hand, social media can be great. I um, work with a lot of bloggers on, on Instagram, Snapchat. Um, for the business, we, like I said, which is which is great, and we can't have such a negative effect all the time because, as as was said before, you can keep in touch with family and friends, etc. Um, but I mean, even when I left school eight like, years ago, we had no lessons on it, and there was no such thing as Snapchat then. There was sort of Facebook was around, but there was no Instagram, no Snapchat, nothing. My niece is eleven, and. She'll come to me and she'll be like, oh, Zara, you know, I've got this and you, my location services are on so everyone can see where I am. I'm like, what? So she's like, oh, yeah, like anybody, a stranger can see where I am. And it exactly shows them exactly where they are. And to them, that seems cool. It seems cool to have the latest filter on your face. It seems cool to have people know where you are. But actually, I think it's really frightening. And a, a girl that who's, who's 22, I'm like, what do you mean? And she, she shows me what to do even sometimes. And even on WhatsApp, you can make private groups. And I just think there's so much more to it than we all probably realise here today. And something needs to be addressed. Like, cyberbullying is horrible. Trolls are horrible. Um, and I think it's a bigger problem than we know. And I also think kids are afraid to talk about it if they do get bullied. Um, for me, I bottled everything up. Um, as a result of that, I was really nervous to go to work because the school um, is about five minutes away. And I remember at ten past three, all the kids would come out and they would pass the shop, and you know they do shout names at you. And it's all right for your mum or your dad or maybe a friend to say, oh, it's all right, Sarah, block it out because you know these people on social media, they're not going to say it to your face and. No, they're not going to say it to your face, but it's how you feel personally. And it was as, a, as a result of that, that has made me depressed in the past. I had to go and see a counsellor. I had anxiety issues. But I still find it really hard to talk about it. Like, today is the first day that I have stood up in front of a group of people and talked about it. And I just think it's now time to maybe give back 
and to teach the kids while they're young um, about social media and the risks that it can have and I don't know maybe if schools maybe even give some sort of leaflet or I don't know something to parents as well because I think it's all right as we all know is teaching them in schools from their sort of nine to three o'clock and then they go home but I think as well I don't know kids have sometimes read a story before they go to bed maybe they should read a a leaflet, I don't know, not a leaflet, but something more interesting about the risks of, risks of social media and if they have been bullied or if they have had a nasty comment then it's okay to talk about it. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it there for today. I don't really think I've got anything else to say, but yeah. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or anything they want to ask? I mean, I've probably waffled on too long. <laughs> I have one. Uh, do you think okay. that a school they had a designated sort of cyberbullying teacher or something where every child could go to it and that would be an effective thing? Yeah. Sort of like Definitely. I mean, like I said, I don't know sort of how up to date sort of schools are, as in do they do lessons or is it once a month they talk about social media? Like, from um, like year five, I mean, we have sex education lessons, and that's how to create a life. Whether those social media gets that bad, in the real world, it, it can end a life. That, that's the harsh thing about it. It really can. Um, I think if I didn't talk when... How can I put this? If I... It all got too much for me at one point. Like it really got too much, and I didn't. I wasn't the person that I was. And if I didn't get the help then, I, I don't know what would have happened. And that's the honest truth. So, and you know, it's not nice saying the antidepressant, but sometimes you've got to do these things because it's it's not normal. It's not normal to get a. Uh, person who you don't know message you. Like I said, no one will come and say this to your face, but I think that's what kids don't really understand. They think, like I said, it's normal to have your location services on bloody Snapchat and Instagram and put exactly where you are in the world and, ah, uh, so yeah. Yeah, so my answer to that is yes. <laughs> I do think it would be very good. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I think I just want to say, you know, actually, you being able to speak now and normalise this happens on a daily, hourly, minute by minute person. Mm. And actually, it is real people mm. in real life, the real people with real emotions. I think it's a really powerful thing to do today. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I've been a social worker, mm. and, <laughs> and I do go into schools on a regular basis. And we all try our best to support children and families with the fallout of social media. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's really important that part of the lessons that children and people get, it is about the fact that it isn't, it isn't just an anonymous thing that can be set on social media. It has consequences. It has real impact on people's lives. And you really have to describe that today. Thank you. It means a lot. <laughs> It's not been easy to stand up here. I feel like my legs were shaking. <laughs> um, yeah? Uh, did other people on the show experience the same kind of abuse? Sorry? Did other people came on the show also experience the same abuse? I would say that unfortunately anybody that put, puts themselves in the public eye, if you're a footballer, if you've gone on a TV show, or if you're a newsreader, you get people that just want to attack you. So I'd say when Sophie comes up next, she, she will 100% agree with me. Um, why it's right, I don't know. In a way, I feel sorry for the people that do it, because I think you obviously have some sort of mental issues, but then they don't understand that what they say can have an effect on, on the person. And I kind of go with a motto at the minute, or a quote, that it's just always be kind because you don't know what people are going through. And it's true. Yeah? Did I think you warned me the last time? Not really. They kind of said, um, expect, you know, for to have a lot of followers and again I think Sophie will agree with me. 
there was a there was a psychiatrist psychiatrist, um, but I left the show and that was it. I didn't hear from them ever again. No, but and I think if I had the time, obviously people that watch the show, I would have done things differently. Um, what happened was the biggest regret of my life, and there's times I think I really wish I never did it. Um, but we all make mistakes, don't we? So we are to perfect. You learn from them. Yeah. Did you have any um, comeback from like the police? Were they just issued with any issues you uh, No, they said I had to uh, like block or report everything through Instagram. The main things that I've had have, have, have always been through Instagram. Um, but do Instagram have any any ways of um, following that up with the people that you're using it? Not that I'm aware of. It um, seems to me that if, you were, if people went around the streets and were verbally abusive, you'd have some reports and it feels as though they're just ignoring the social media. A hundred percent. A greater impact. Literally, I go on Instagram and it says report and it says some something along the lines of, we have now blocked this profile, they won't be able to see you, you won't be able to see them. I've even had people pretend to be me on social media and contact young guys and girls, I forgot to mention this actually, um, and like giving out a fake mobile number and saying, oh, um, oh I'm in Manchester on you know, Friday, shall we meet up? And people are messaging me saying, Darren, is this you? And I'm like, uh, hello, like, does it really sound like me? No. And this, all I could do is report it and ask friends and family and all my followers to report it. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And for me, that's the biggest risk. Yeah. That there's just there's no need for people to do anything without any consequences. Exactly. They get away with it and they think that's okay. And at the end of the day, we don't know who they are. them probably realise more, if that makes sense. Um, I think sometimes, like, no offence, but if it was in an assembly or a, a class, they, they get bored and they might play with the friends and they might not take it seriously, but I think if they hear it from a real account, even if it's from a video, if you play it on the screen, I think that makes it slightly more real and then they might realise. Um, weirdly, somebody actually mentioned that to me this week and she said because it would actually help me as well kind of get over what's happened, but yeah, so yes, this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is like as well, I get a bit, even from that because somebody said, oh well, why don't you go to, um, not the press, but something like the press, let's say, and, and sort of share your experience from, from how the show or how it's kind of made you feel, as in the bullies and the trolls. And I said, do you know what? I said, the press is so horrible half the time, they make it worse. Mm -hmm. Like, it, then, then you're kind of encouraging the, the, the trolls and the bullies to, to get back in touch or to make a new account and be a different person. And kind of that same when she mentioned this, this lady, so why don't you do a video? I thought, well, you know, it would be good to raise awareness, but at the same time, like, why do I want to put myself in sort of the limelight as such again to kind of, yeah, get more bullies and trolls when I kind of feel like I've made a progress to get away from it? So, it's so annoying, yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you think then there's a big responsibility in here? We talked about that, about the press, and, and, and I hate to think certain celebrities. Mm. Don't portray good social networking behaviours. Now I'll pick on somebody like Beyonce, posting a naked picture of herself. That's encouraging those who follow her and, and do it to behave yeah. in the same way. Well, I don't write. Um, no, I'm sure there's quite a lot of you that like the Kardashians in here. I hate them. I absolutely can't stand them. Why teenage girls have to have the latest Kylie Jenner lip something or the other is ridiculous. They are an example 
that make young girls want to get a lip filler, they want to look like them, they think it's normal to have the most amazing designer clothes, the best car, and that is like, hello, what, what, what are you doing? This is like a girl who's 11 or 12 or 13 that, I was 11 or 12 or 13, I didn't even have a phone, I didn't wear any makeup, and I mean, we're not even talking that long ago realistically. But yeah, celebrities, not all of them, but they don't show a great um, image, or they don't show a great role model. But unfortunately, how on earth we're going to stop that? I don't, I don't know. You can tell kids every single day, or you know, no, but Beyonce sings my favourite song, sir, or da 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 da. And it's like, oh god, okay, yes. Um, but yeah, but it's the norm. If you see bloody Kim Kardashian post a picture of a bum, and with about three kids around her, and she looks incredible. And then that's, you kind of go on to the same thing, airbrushing. I've been on photo shoots before and I think, I look at the picture the next day, I'm like, hmm? Like, <laughs> I haven't been to the gym that much. Like, my skin's really smooth. Like, uh, no, that's not me. Like, my lips have got bigger, my teeth have got whiter, and I'm like, oh, right, okay. Okay, I'll just be airbrushed, right? It's fine. Which, not, it's not okay. So, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. I think what you said about, um, Yeah. Not you yourself, but within almost like a example of anywhere. Definitely. You, you <coughs> say to them, so it's not you out there on your own. Yeah, but even like, let's even say if a primary school did say to me, oh, do you, would you come and do this? Or even a secondary school, really. I think something like that, I wouldn't mind, but it's just the whole press aspect, if that makes sense. Um, that's what I would want to do. I think. A video like you said, yeah, but then I think maybe if they saw an actual real person in real life where they could say, oh, actually, could we do a Q&A after? I think that's really good going to schools as well. Yeah, but then how, I don't, how do I go about that? Just, just within YouTube. <laughs> yeah. You, you reach so many more people. Yeah. teacher but I'm so rubbish at maths I couldn't get my maths GCSE and this will make that I researched four times and each time I got a worse mark and it was foundation so I, I just looked by my calculator now I'm at work and thank god everybody pays on my card anyway um so yeah um I'd be honoured it would it would mean a lot yeah did you actually stop using social media yourself uh, at one point yes completely stopped um, and then unfortunately I went back on but I, 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 like I said it sounds daft but because me and mum have got two ladies fashion boutiques the majority of people that even come in the shop say oh I've just seen it you just posted that video on Facebook mum and I do a live video on Facebook every Wednesday showing what new stocks in and da 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 da, da. but it, it generates sales that's how unfortunately social media is good and bad I'm sure a lot of schools are on social media as in, oh, today the schools are closed because it's snowed. Did you drop any? Drop any? Did you drop Instagram? You said that's the wrong I dropped Facebook, but then still have the Facebook page for the shop, but then unfortunately I have gone back on all of them. And is it still going on? Oh, yeah, every day. Every day. But like I said, Instagram. I've never had the odd thing on Facebook, <coughs> nothing on Snapchat. Instagram is the worst by far. Yeah. Um, not really a question, I just want to say thank you for your talk. Um, um, it's very brave. You get I've experienced similar things myself, so well done. Thank um, you. And also to let everyone know, I'm so I'm from the University of Huddersfield and there's a current project going on across Europe. Um, and
currently in the second phase of consulting with students, I think we've just done the UK and we're about to go to Denmark. Um, so it's primary level and they're creating a web app to go into schools for teachers and children um, around this topic, around you know social media and all those, and how to say so online. So from the talks that are going on, it sounds like that might be a possibility to look into. They said it's very early days, um, but it might end up on the, the big capacity to have videos uploaded of information. I think that's something I'll take back to the team about your uh, sort of the conversation around um, personal stories and personalising it. You know, I think that's really important. Thank you. Thanks. very, very similar experiences on um, social media. I mean, today everyone does have an online business, apart from the five people who said they didn't. Um, you know, just like we all have a name, we have an online personality. I know I do, and it's not necessarily always a true reflection of who I am. An online existence gives us all a manner of freedom, of expression, of expression and choice. It's a right we all have to enjoy as part of everyday life. However, that can quickly be eroded by what we have come to identify as online trolling, or as some know it as cyberbullying. An internet troll slash cyberbully is a member of an online community who deliberately sets out to attack, disrupt, upset and offend, just generally cause distress. And this is usually by comments or photos or any form of online content. They can be found all over the internet, WhatsApp, hobby forums, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, gaming sites, literally anywhere online. They can launch an attack at any time on anyone and can leave you feeling extremely vulnerable, unsafe and very, very upset. This can usually result in a lot of social, psychological and educational impacts on the victim, which I'm sure Emma is going to cover. And we must not overlook the fact online bullying is every bit as destructive as face-to-face -face bullying. If not, sometimes it can be worse, in my experience. One single posting of an insult, such as a comment on someone's looks, hair or weight, can become viral by repeated sharing. Imagine someone highlighting your very deepest insecurity and pointing it out online and then having that shared or commented on by hundreds of people. I mean, this is like your deepest insecurity. It's, it's, it's not a very nice feeling at all. It can, online bullying provides the perpetrator a sense of distance from their targets. So there is an immediate lack of guilt, feedback, or consequence. They perceive themselves to be in a position of strength, hence the term, I'm sure many of you have come across it, keyboard warrior. So it makes it difficult for the target to escape, as it can happen at all hours, and while in the comfort and safety of our own homes, which Tom touched on. Suddenly your sanctuary and your place of shelter from the world can rapidly become tainted and offer us no contentment at a time of need. And an endless amount of anxiety and unrest can result from such torment. And if I suffered this as an adult, feeling such unrest in my own home, knowing what was going on on all these apps and on social media, imagine how that would affect a child. I, I, I can't, I'm so glad I didn't grow up with social media when I was younger. I just, I, I don't think I, I would have coped at all. So yes, like Zara, um, I too appeared on the national TV show Love Island. No one anticipated its success and popularity, and in an instant, I was catapulted from my everyday life as a digital marketing social media executive to being thrust into just the limelight and so coming out to so many followers on social media. Um, we became public property overnight. Everybody had an opinion, be it both good or bad. And on leaving the show, pretty much like Zara, I descended into 
quite a dark, dark place, owing to the amount of negativity focused towards me. I mean, granted there were positives and there were fans and, you know, some lovely, lovely people, but I would always let the negatives outweigh the positives. I don't know why, I would, I would obsess, I would almost go looking for the negatives because I knew it would be there. I would put my name into Twitter and, and search to see, you know, what horrible things had been written, written about me, I almost like tormenting myself. It, it did become a bit of an obsession. Um, and some of the worst comments still resonate to this day. Um, one of them being, I effing hate you, I wish you would die of cancer. I mean, these people didn't personally know me. Um, they were going by what was shown on a TV show from a whole day. It was put into 45 minutes. It just, it, to have that level of hate for someone, I mean, there, there are some really, really strange people out there. And this was another good one. Sophie is the ugliest girl in there. Her skin is shit, and so are her eyelashes. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it made me laugh so much, that one, because like, how and why would someone think, you know, commenting on something like eyelashes was actually significant? But being only human, I made the biggest mistake. I actually responded to the comments, which on reflection is exactly what I think these individuals want. Um, I fed them by responding and I think from my experience people tend to make two mistakes when confronted with negativity. They either ruminate and obsess over the problem as I did um, or they try to numb their emotions which I did as well with a lot of alcohol. Um, so I think that rumination thing like obsessing over it is deceptive because you, you try to think things through. Um, but obsession over the situation that caused me so much pain only reinforced the strengths of the negative thoughts and emotions so I started to believe that what these people were saying about me was true and I just hated myself and I thought I don't deserve to enjoy the success of this anymore um, I'm a shit person, I'm horrible and I would just sort of hold myself up in my apartment and, and not really go anywhere, I didn't want to face the world um, so yeah, numbing the emotions didn't work either because you can't selectively numb an emotion. Um, I tried to blot out my anger and in doing so I blotted out a lot of my happiness and contentment um, and avoided um, a lot of things which didn't help me um, deal with the situation. I literally just kept numbing and numbing and just not going anywhere and literally for the year after, after Love Island it was just it was quite a dark place to be in. Um, so yes, I made those mistakes, um, but today is a different story and I'm so glad to be here talking to you and hopefully this will have some positive um, effect. Um, I never give my power away anymore by blaming others for the way that they feel. I've gone from being a target from blaming, judging and criticising to assuming full responsibility and today I take a different approach of how I deal with their negativity. I ignore it, I laugh at it, I can be quite sarcastic on Twitter, back to the trolls. Um, and I feel embarrassed for them, but mostly I, I, I pity them because I think, you know, how negative a place must you be in to want to hate someone so much that you've actually got to put it out there. I've, I've never understood that. No, like, why would you want to be so, so nasty about someone that you don't know? Um, so yeah, so far we talked about being the target focus, but I think sometimes what we need to address is the trolls themselves. Who and what are they? There's the possibility trolls might be made rather than born and are just ordinary people like you and me. In fact, a new research shows that trolling is more situational than an innate characteristic. In other words, under the right or wrong circumstances, anyone can become a troll. So through a combination of experimentation, data analysis and machine learning, we can identify two key factors that make the average person more likely to troll. The first is their emotional state or mood. Trolling ebbs and flows with people's emotions depending on the time and day of the week, apparently. People are most likely to troll late at night and the beginning of the work or school week. Maybe they just don't like getting up on a Monday and they're a little bit miserable and just want to take it out somewhere. I know, I know that feeling, but you know, I wouldn't take that on anyone else. Um, there is even some evidence of 
um, the smooth spilling over from um, discussion into whether the person simply participating in the same discussion as a troll is more likely a troll in a later unrelated discussion. And the second factor is the context of the discussion a person is having. Seeing prior troll comments in a discussion doubles a person's likelihood of subs subsequently trolling. And it has a domino effect. The more troll comments there are at the start of a discussion, the more likely subsequent participants will also troll. So, for instance, on Instagram, when um, I post a picture and one, one troll starts saying it, and they're going to reply to their comments as the facility where you can reply to other trolls and, you know, just keep it going. And once one starts, they all want to start. And, oh, just it is like a real, real domino effect. So, I mean, any person that wakes up on the wrong side of the bed has the potential to be a troll. It really is, you know, that easy. It's essential that I think we discuss candidly that thought and try to enlighten any individual thinking about becoming a troll. Once it's out there, it's done. Like the, the toothpaste um, situation, you know, once, <laughs> once it's there, it's not going to go away. Um, and with the advent of screenshots and also IP address tracking now, you know, you can be found. I mean, like, you know, that, that in itself, you know, it's, it's, I think, a, it's a kind of a scare tactic for trolls, you know. Don't do it because you'll be found. Um, you can be arrested now. So, yeah, once there's no turning back the clock and there's no magic eraser that's going to get rid of it, something written can come back to haunt you in years to come um, when emotions at the time are nothing but a distant memory. Regret and shame are very bitter swills to swallow, so the simple answer is don't do it. Um, I have a friend of mine um, called Paul and his daughter. Kat is a 12-year-old girl, normal girl, pretty girl, likes horse riding, She's, she does a bit of modelling. Um, at school they've been having a really hard time and I sort of wanted to tell you about this because um, I'm speaking with her and sort of helping her through this. She's having a very, very hard time. Um, and it's something that I actually went through at school. I went through a lot of bullying when I was younger, especially when I started modelling. Um, it just seemed to really, really make some, some girls irate and they were my friends and it just turned on me for no reason and it broke my heart. It really did. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. So. I asked Paul if I could share his experience, and this is his testimony about um, his daughter. Um, so yes, uh, it started firstly offline, face to face. Um, intimidation began from her getting on the bus all the way through the day and lessons and break times through to the return bus home, journey home. And then it went online. Um, where the bully and her followers ran a poll asking, vote now, who wants to see Kat pushed over and hurt? And they responded with voice memos and online votes. Between Snapchat and WhatsApp, they were trying to torture her by saying things online, as if she was not seeing what they were saying, but they knew she was in the group. Um, it's evil. So yeah, I have um, actually some screenshots which Paul has very kindly shared with me, um, because I just want to make you aware of that it can happen on WhatsApp and um, Snapchat. And they've got this thing that the kids are doing called show and cover. Has anybody heard of it? Yeah. Um, um, but I do think as, as teachers and heads that you should, should be aware of it. And I mean, the psychological effect that's, that this can have on, uh, on youngsters right now. So yes. Um, this is just, um, from the outset, Paul agreed not to spy on her phone. It was agreed if she was mature enough to have a mobile, then she should be aware it was one of his phones. And they've allowed her to use her phone as long as they've got open access. Um, so these are ways that Paul's dealing with it. She's allowed WhatsApp only and messages, no messages are to be deleted. Um, Paul's been a like, really sort of understanding dad to the whole situation. And I think some parents need to learn to own up when their kids are trolls instead of denying it. He's had a very, very hard time with the parents of these girls who have been bullying and they've been denying it. And um, he woke up to a message from one of the parents at about four o'clock in the morning for some reason, being, you know, let's put an end to this, let's put an end to this, I can't sleep. And it's like, well, no, I think it's, it's, it's gone too far now. 
Um, I won't go through all the, uh, the situation of how they dealt with it. We need to wrap it up now. But um, yeah, next slide. It's just a picture of a cat. That's a little cat. <laughs> She's just a happy normal girl. Um, yes, the next, one, the next one. I'll show you this. Um, this was one of my personal experiences very recently on Monday. Um, the picture there you see is on my Instagram story and I, I had an opinion on an article in a paper which was, um, I don't know if you know about it, it's Fern McCann and her boy, ex-boyfriend's in prison now because he sprayed acid, acid over a club of, he hit about 17 people um, and badly scarring a few of them. And I keep seeing the article in papers, you know, why I've got to visit my ex-boyfriend in jail. And I just had an opinion on it. I just said, I wish she'd stop using this to put her, her face out there. It's not right. I feel sorry for the victims. You know, I wasn't rude or I didn't swear. I just had an opinion on something. In hindsight, I, I should have done it because I knew I would get crap back. But um, because I had an opinion, I got like, th these are, this is the type of response. It's just very subjective and I mean F off you slag, you're not in her position quite frankly aren't entitled to an opinion. So what I did, and some people might not agree with this, but this girl is actually local and um, I searched for her name in Facebook, I, I was, it was a Sunday, I had some time on my hands, and um, I put it in my status and said if anybody knows this girl, you know, would they like to pass on the message that, you know, she can argue a point. Um, without being so rude, blah, 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 blah. And I actually tagged her work in it because she worked for a local gym and I said she works here if anybody wants to pass on the message. Because I, I just had enough. Um, and then she saw it and she literally, she messaged me again yesterday saying, um, wishing me good luck to come to this talk and how sorry she was and how she just had such a bad day. And, um, and I thought, Yes, it was a kind of bad thing to publicly shame her, but the positive to come from it was that it made her realise, you know, the impact of what she said. Um, so yeah, I was I was kind of glad because now she's hopefully she'll be a better person for it. <laughs> um, but yes, so um, I've got one more slide just for a bit of a laugh. Different types of trolls. Um, the, the most, the, the more frequent troll I've come across is the, the insult troll, which um, is the main one that's seen in schools and by police actually, Paul was telling me, the father of Cat, um, was telling me that when he speaks to, when he spoke to the police, um, I think they said that about 70% of their time was now taken up with cyberbullying and cyber trolls and things on social media and kids, um, but yes, the insult troll is a pure hater, plain and simple, and they don't even really have to have a reason to hate or insult someone. They'll, they're the types of trolls that will often pick on everyone and anyone, calling them names, accusing them of certain things, doing anything they can to get a negative emotional response, just because they can. In many cases, this type of trolling can become so severe that it can lead or be considered a serious form of cyberbullying. And I think we all know where that can end up, as we've seen um, in the news, you know kids, I think as young as nine, taking their own lives. Because that is, you know, as I said, that is the, the harsh reality of it and I think something needs to be done. Um, so yeah, I have actually got a URL for that, um, for all those different types of trolls if you wanted to um, have a look at that. But yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay, any questions? I think Zora might have uh, answered them all. Yeah, sure. Um, with cats, yeah. what do the school do? Um, the school have actually been extremely supportive. They're closing in on, um, and Paul has actually said, I want you to stress over how great the school's been. They've looked after and they're actually closing in on the group and then they know the main perpetrator and all the other girls who were sort of following this have backed off because they know it's going to stop. Um, so yeah, it's, it's still ongoing though, he said, the bullying, I mean, unless they take her out of the school, I, I just, I don't really know what their, um, what their answer would be. Yeah. Yes? Just from the, the way you were talking, do you think there is scope for 
not only how to stay safe online, but something about um, reinforcing positive identity traits or emotional well-being, resilience, those sorts of things in schools. I think so, yeah. I think, well, like I say, I think the education needs to be put towards perhaps stopping the trolls rather than how to cope with it. Let's nip it in the bud before it begins. And I do think that parenting also has a lot to do with it, um, emotional and psychological, and just making sure that your, your child is a good child and doesn't want to, you know, hate people for no reason. Um, so yes, I think that there, there should be a way of managing trolls. Like say, for instance, you know, IP addresses can be tracked now, so just don't do it once it's out there, it's out there for good. I mean, putting out murderous threats and saying you wish the one would die of cancer, if that comes around to, to bite you on that arse later on, you know, it could affect you, you, your ability to get a job, you know, just to be part of life. So I think that needs to be reiterated so much that just to not put it out there. Yes? Thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you. Thank you. So you say it's really easy to focus on all the negative that is coming at you. Yeah. And you said you managed to get over that. What advice would you give them to young people to stop just looking at all the negative that is coming at you? God, you've got to be so resilient not to. I mean, I think, oh, depends on the person. It would be very, very hard to manage it because, you know what, it's just one click. One little search and it's there, you can see it, it's so easy, it's in your hand when you're sat in your bedroom. Um, I would say just try and rise above it and keep busy and realise what you've got around you. Focus on your friends and your family and the people that love you. Don't look for praise from people who aren't your people. Um, stop worrying what people think. But it's a very, it's a very hard one to, to advise. I would never advise responding. Um, certainly not. I don't think you should meet here with her. I think, um, I think reporting it would be the best way to go, rather than responding, because you can just add flames to the fire. So, and from my own experience, feeding it just. No, it's not. It's not the way to go. It makes it worse. They like it. <laughs> yes. Uh, can I just add to your your, your story there? Um, I um uh, I, I used to look after some secondary school up in a uh, really quite a rural small community, and social media is great for a lot of our students because they don't see each other very often uh, outside of school because of yeah. the geographic location. But we have an ongoing issue with groups of girls primarily, but sometimes boys as well, in that same situation where. Uh, something like uh, your sort of friend Paul had exactly that same situation. We work very, very closely with those students and their families to get them all together, to resolve the differences, to understand it. And at one point you think, actually, great, we've got that, all the girls are all happy uh, and fine. Mm. It stops. And then all it takes is just one comment from one of the students goes away and then the whole thing builds up again and it's incredible. And some of the girls who have been in that situation said, right, one of the things they said, I'm going to switch off social media and I'm not going to look at it. Yeah. But then we have this tremendous, and an anxiety then builds up because they're worried about what everybody is saying on yes. that social media. So that's, yeah. what do you call it, F fear of missing out? FOMO. Um, it FOMO, and it comes straight back again. Yeah. And um, we, we put on, and people sort of saw about, well, what do you do about it? We, we, we believe that quite a lot of this work with, with the parents and actually helping educate the parents to no longer think that I can't look at my child's mobile phone, I can't be interested in what they're doing, and going for that open access model about explaining to them and, and sort of sharing those things. Because what we're finding is those students, when they suffer these issues at school, if they feel they can't talk about it to school, if they feel they can't talk about it to parents, it builds up, builds up and turns into something which is really absolutely atrocious. So, we're certainly in the situation of making sure that students know that they can come and talk to us about it. And as, as, as a result of that, we know a lot more about it, but it is like fighting fires. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we imagine. can't take them away from it. Uh, in fact, we were in the papers last year because we talked about, as a school, banning all mobile phone communication and actually putting a transmitter up into school. And then some, suddenly wow. got some taken out, out, completely out of context what we're trying to do, but we were trying to get the message. And I suppose, we're still now a year on after doing all that, 
I think we're very, very good at we, we work with the police, we work with some social service and everybody trying to help it. But every time we put out a fire, it just takes a spark to build up again. And I and we're we're now back into the sort of situation where we think if we could actually just not have mobile phones at all within school during the daytime, the mental health of our children will improve enormously. What are the rules like for mobile phones in schools? Is it only break time or school had Yeah, yeah, good. The parent takes it that the amount of bullying that happens via social media in the daytime has lessened. Mm. So hopefully there's some kind of safe haven that school during the day, but when you get home or you leave school, that's, you know, they all walk out and they won't walk home. Yeah, <laughs> it, do you know what it is? I mean, it's, admittedly, I'm, I'm addicted to my iPhone. Me and my mum's here, she you knows, she's always like, Sophie, hi. <laughs> like, you know, I'm lost in Instagram. And obviously, I do, I look after clients, social media for work, and it's just, oh, yeah, it's 24 7. Eric, this is fantastic. You need to do this with your kids to stop this happening. It's, it's human nature. I mean, some of the parents that he spoke to, like this, you know, the woman who texts about four o'clock in the morning, they have denied all responsibility. It's, it's a very, very tough one. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think in that case, all you can offer then is just um, a kind of counselling or whatever for the for the victims of it and just you know let them know that yes it is wrong and we are here we are here to support you and you are not alone and we'll try and get this nipped in the bud and stop have they ever had any parents who have been uh, like parents of bullies just say oh no well, <coughs> they just not do anything about it just they know just that they do what they want. Right, talking to one of the things that we said before is that the kids seem to know more than yeah. the, the adults. Well, the problem is, I think, because if we're not careful, we try and talk about tech, whereas actually we need to be talking about behaviour. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as parents, we have that wisdom. We've been there, we've been the bullies, done the bullying, now understand the victimisation. We have that knowledge, so let's forget trying to out techie the kids. Let's talk about the root problem, which is. People with people's behaviour, they talk about people. Yeah, definitely. Is there any scope for kind of engaging and empowering the children themselves to go home <coughs> and sit with the parents and give them the information in a way that might be? Well, child net do a lot of their work, don't they, along yeah. that? They do digital ambassadors and this kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it's a brilliant way of engaging parents. Parents are interested in what kids say. What the kids want. What the kids want. Kids tell them. I think it's critical. That certainly should. And that peer to peer stuff, the peer to peer support is, is where it sits. Because they're not going to talk to adults because they're embarrassed, they're ashamed, or whatever. <coughs> so we've got to get a generation that can help each other. I wonder if it would be better to, or maybe the only resort is to actually go into the, the homes of the, the parents. Yeah. I, 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 interestingly, the point about. Um, no, Maybe need that mediator between someone who can connect with the child and connect with the parent at the same time. Yeah.
Yeah. Mirroring. Yes, hi. What, what I say to parents in that situation is a motorway is really dangerous. We don't allow children to drive on a motorway. But my kids see me drive on the motorway every day. There is a parental responsibility to acknowledge that this tool that I choose to use as an adult is dangerous for a child. Yeah. And I frequently tell, use that analogy with parents, you would not let your child drive your car. Yeah. They see you driving it all the time, they know it's okay for mum and dad to drive it, but they know that they're not ready for that yet. And there has to be some sort of groundswell, and, I, and it's really hard when we're tying these apples in school in our own little pockets, but there has to be some sort of groundswell of, you are giving your child something that is dangerous. You have to go through the same process as you would for learning to drive or going to the park on your own. We don't let toddlers cross the road and go to the park. So why do we give them an iPad? Then and then not could argue what that they're doing. There's apps made for children and parents are just going, here, play, play on that while I you know, Which, talk to my friends. I'm sure if I'd got an iPad when I'd got three children under two, I am sure I would have given them an iPad for five minutes a piece so I could go for a week or whatever. <laughs> it's about supervision and it's about appropriate yes. use. And it's about saying time management. You can play on that game whilst I'm watching you, but I'm not just going to give you my unlocked iPad and let you on YouTube. Mm, God, no. We we can't pretend that more <clears throat> social media is going to go away. So we have to learn how to protect children on it. Just like nobody's going to rip up the motorways. Well, we already have a really good system for protecting children on motorways, and we need to do the same with social media. Yeah, I agree. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to carry on like this. I'm a break into song, I apologise. I'm not going to come up here and just talk about the negatives. Um, I'm not going to do that because, what it would be ironic, I've got two tech companies. And secondly, because there's a lot of good involved. It isn't the phone that bullies anyone. It is absolutely the people behind it. And the other issue is the fact that you can't engage parents. And the reason that you can't engage parents is the only parents that who really engage are the ones whose kids are infected badly. So it makes sense that for most parents, if their child is sat upstairs in their bedroom and they're just not going out, they're not causing a social disturbance, they're not getting asbos anymore, actually it feels really positive because, you know, my kid just seems to be getting on with it. And until your child is a victim, it feels like it works. So when you talk about engagement, the problem is that the parents whose children are leading groups of bullies or activating negativity online, they're happy. So it's more about how we change the culture, isn't it? The culture of cyber technology is that this is not cyber life, this is real life now. That's really hard for us to get our heads around. This is the first generation in America, Centennials, it's the first generation where cyber technology is connected with children from day one. It's everywhere, it's in everything that they do. So to have an idea that there's a juxtaposition between cyber and real is now not true. Our children from day one are growing up, becoming part of a society that has never known anything but this experience. I can't even stand here now and tell you how it's going to affect us because the research has only been going on for a short period of time. I can tell you some things, so I can tell you that you're more likely to be bullied because bullying is now considered something that if somebody says something negative about you online, that is considered bullying, right? Systematic bullying is obviously where people consistently troll you. And to be honest, in this room, there are probably some grammar and spelling trolls right here. I am one of them. If you abuse me online and you spelt it wrong, I'm going to tell you why you spelt it wrong. So, to some degree, the problem that we have is we don't understand it yet. When we look at the brain development of children, lots of primary head teachers here and secondary school teachers. So secondary, you will all know the impacts between being a child of 9 and 10 to being a child of 13 and 14. Primary school children have a much better emotional vocabulary. They understand the nuances of language, they understand the nuances of facial expression. If I look at a child and I'm disappointed when they're eight, they can kind of figure out I'm disappointed. If I'm embarrassed, they'll kind of get it. You kind of get to 13 and you just look at an adult and think they hate me. They're disappointed and I'm angry. 
And that is actually something that isn't to do with the child, it's to do with the brain. So we absolutely know that. What's changing is the way that children's brains are dealing with immediacy. And when our speakers were talking about one of the differences between bullying face-to-face -face and bullying online is that bullying face-to-face, -face, firstly, takes quite a lot of emotional feeling. You know, I really have to not like you, or I really have to be quite jealous of you, or I really have to covet the life that I think you have or the friends that you have, and that promotes a lot of anger and anguish, or I want power over you because I think you're better looking than me. The difference between online bullying is it's just basically, it's there, somebody's done something that mildly annoys me, I'm gonna react. And it's immediacy based. And all of you head teachers know, and all of you teachers and social workers know that young people are not good with regulation. I don't know any adults who are that good with regulation. If anybody here has been drunk, then you're not good with regulation. Humans like to feel. We like to feel so many different feelings. We like to feel good, we like to feel bad, we like to feel happy, we like to feel sad, we like to feel everything because it makes us feel human. And when you come from an experience where you have a wonderful foundation, loving parents, an environment where every single need that you have is catered for, you know, where when you come home from a bad day, somebody's there to say it's okay, when you come see, sit you down and tell you that you're loved. Well, the chances are that to some degree, the impact of those individuals with poor self-regulation who say something nasty to you online will be limited. But you start to fracture any of that equation. And for some of you here, you'll work in the areas that I used to work, which with high social deprivation, really low socioeconomic environment, really poor aspirational behaviours. Every single one of those fractures, both from the bully to the bullied, gets bigger and deeper and more brave. So what we're always talking about when we start looking at the bigger picture is unhappy kids. We're just looking at unhappy children. Unhappy children, primary school, unhappy children, secondary school, unhappy children in society. Because people who want to make people be in pain and have power over them are unhappy, and people who receive all of that are made to feel unhappy, it's unhappiness. And then we start looking back, when did it start? When did it really start? So 20 years ago, it blew up. You know, we got probably MySpace and Facebook started to be developed 2004, that really blew up. So at that point, we also started to see a huge amount in the media on general media channels, which are programs that incite bullying. So we started to see things like The X Factor. We started to see things like, now Britain's Got Talent. My children have been banned from watching that since it began. And it's been banned because in my household, I don't accept people laughing at people with mental health issues. Anybody in this room who has watched X Factor, anybody in this room who's allowed their children to watch Britain's Got Talent, you allow your children to applaud bullying. Does anybody allow their children to do that? Does anybody watch that program? Okay. And for those of you who are like, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that, that was bad. That's what we do. We're becoming the most judgmental society. When I work with groups of young people, and when I ask them to explain and explore why their deep unhappiness exists, there are different schemes that come out, but always confusion. I'm so confused. I don't know where I belong. I don't know whether I'm loved. I don't think I'm going to aspire to anything because, let's say, in the more challenged of environments, maybe the education system just doesn't quite fit them. I mean, every teacher I've ever met is far more creative, imaginative, innovative than the system allows them essentially to really be. So I know the frustrations. I come from a teaching family. I've worked in education for 15 years. You all know the issues. Everything that I say here and now, you all know. But the bigger issue, the wider issue is why, in this day and age, with all of our privileges, in a country that's developed to some degree, why are we still one of the lowest countries in Europe for well-being? Why are we still not reaching our children? That's the key to discovering why children decide to use technology to aggress other children. Firstly, because they don't really think it makes that much of a difference. If you've never experienced bullying, how are you ever going to quantify the impact? Who here has dumped somebody? Oh, come on, you will, come on. It's not like we're in a room of rejects here. <laughs> Most of us have been dumped. 
Thank you, Donny Bond, when I was 14. I've done the dumb thing too, let me tell you. It feels bad to dump someone, but it feels a lot worse to get dumped, right? You don't, when you are the perpetrator, ever really internalise what it's like to be a victim. The only time you can understand what it's like to be a victim is therefore to be a victim. And what we can't do is get a group of people in a room and bully them all to make them see. <laughs> Even though that might have an effect. I was commenting about the thing on social media that you've seen in a column that I write. It's where the father had found out that his son had bullied some children on the bus. You might have seen it. He makes a child run to school a mile and he's commentating it all the way. And you're just sitting and thinking, what an irony that this really overgrown bully cannot see what he's created. Our society has got a really skewed vision of what children are. You haven't. You live it. You know, you see the amazing creativity and innovation of each child. And sometimes for you guys, that's a challenge because our system doesn't necessarily create those little unbelievable beings that could be so many things. So the frustrations that start to build as a child, when you start seeing difference, I have two boys, I'm a state system advocate, and my boys go to what I would say is uh, average state school. It has some very poor children, it has some relatively wealthy children, most of them are kind of in the middle. It would be ridiculous of me to say that the kids that come around my house who have got ADHD, for example, and parents who are dysfunctional and who haven't got a car to go to school, it would be strange for me to expect that those children could feel happy for my kids. Because we live in a competitive society where our very being is about what have you got, what can you buy, because we're sold a capitalist myth that all of you know. It says, what you have makes you happy. The Kardashian culture, as much as it's horrendous, and as much as I dislike it, can any of you here really sit and say to one of your students, but would you really like that life? I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, we might not want to put naked pictures on our Instagram, of course not, but would you like access to anything and everything? The other day, they put Kylie Jenner's wardrobe, her bag collection. She has more in her bag collection than I have ever owned. That's their life. So why are we trying to deny children those aspirations when all we sell is those aspirations? If that's our culture, it's aspirational, right? Do this, get this. Do this, get this. We have to change the whole fabric of our identity with what we're selling to children before we can challenge the identity of our cyber culture. The cyber world's wonderful. It's like one of the most exciting arenas. It's one of the most burgeoning arenas of new possibilities, and that's before we even get to the AI. That's coming next. For all you teachers, that will be exciting. You couldn't afford teaching assistants, but now meet John. My AI does everything, teaching assistant. That's happening. But we're not getting control just yet of the cyber world because we don't understand it. The most important development for me is this. We know that as much as we think that kids can get tech addicted, actually, if they have two days without it, they're pretty much fine. So we can all stop worrying that everybody in the UK is literally going to end up having a relationship only with a screen. That's a fact. So what do we need to do to make this happy? Like I said, Cyberbullying is going to happen. The only people who can change it are you guys. And that's the truth, because what I said about home is true. Very few adult parents are going to do anything to change their children's behaviours if it's working for their children, if it's working to keep a quiet household. And that's before you even talk about the ones who are socioeconomically deprived, who have parents who are horrible. Because there are lots of kids in the UK with absolutely reprehensible, neglectful parents which the NSPCC will be able to tell you more about. It's an astounding figure, and it's happening, and it's here, and it's now. So the idea of us suddenly being able to get people at home to do this work for us, it's not, you know what, I've said this for 20 years, everything falls on the shoulders of teachers, it shouldn't. 
but everything falls on the shoulders of teachers and social workers and people who work in that field. Even people like myself, but less so, because let's be honest, there's no funding anymore to have people like me. So you guys, you make the difference. Um, when you were talking about the helplessness before, I think that that sense of helplessness, you know, how do we change it? Well, one of the things that was said about bringing people into school is true. Bring people into school who've been affected by it, but also bring real people in. Actually, the evidence that we see in motivating change is not through influencers. It's through real people. Because I can't, I can't relate to an influencer. Do you understand? I can relate that their life's different. I can relate that they're a role model. I can say, hey, it happens to you too. But that's not the same as finding out that that mum who lost her seven-year-old son because he hanged himself and hearing her pain that changes, that changes people, and you can all have access to that. There are so many programs around, there's so many people doing things to get into schools to actually discuss that with very young children, and primary children are key. There where it happens, there where it transforms everything. Because the thing about our education service, it's democratic, you know? It's free. Kids can come from horrible homes, and at the moment at least have a free school meal, to some degree. How long that'll go on for, we're not sure, but you know, it can happen. And they can be loved, because education is loving, and teachers are loving. And the problem that happens with cyberbullying is we dislike bullies. We're hardwired to. Every successful person on the whole has had an instance of somebody playing with power over them. We all have, I have, from a young age, you, know, you can remember those people who just kind of perniciously attacked you to some degree, whether you were a child or an adult. And for most of us, we've forged the resilience to get over that. It wouldn't matter what he said to me online. I've had loads of things. It doesn't matter. I just think, whatever, knock yourself out. You've wasted a few minutes of your time. James Blunt is a great example of a celebrity who uses sarcasm and wit. You know, personally, I just think, bless you. You know, but I'm not a 14-year-old girl who's just been called a slag. I'm not that child who already feels isolated, who's now been told that none of the guys like them because they're a virgin. These things have great meaning to children, and the only thing that can change it is compassion and kindness, and that's the only thing that we have to offer. So the thing about behaviour versus cyber is kind of all the same. Yes, the person behind the phone is the problem, but the phone is the vessel, therefore they are the same. My job is consistently the same. The only way to change bullies' behaviour is to change those who are bullied so that they no longer can be bullied. But at the same position, we've seen that when it gets to physical, it doesn't matter what I say, because even if you avoid it, ignore it, even if you speak to people around you to ask for help, and that person's still waiting on the corner to beat you up with the other lads or girls, then that's real. So then how do we meet that? Well, at the same position, we have to meet the bullies with compassion and not dislike them. We have to reach into their worlds and meet them. We have to understand what's formed them. We have to reach into their unhappiness and soothe it. And that's the bigger issue. So when it comes down to what makes a better society, what makes a better society is everybody in this room. And what challenges cyberbullying, it doesn't stop it, is everybody who reinforces a child's self-worth and works on the self-esteem and creates programs of support so that every child coming into school understands what's right and wrong. We inform them, you know, one of the things that was really important and said before was at the end of the day, it is illegal to sext, for example, pornographic pictures of yourself. It is important to talk to children from a very young age about sex and relationships and owning their own bodies and having power over what they believe that they should or shouldn't share. It's about teaching them excellent relationships. It's about showing them that in life, you get a lot further being good. You get a lot further being nice. You get a lot further being kind. But it's also about creating systems where children don't feel neglected within them. Bullies have a lot of time on their hands. Systematic bullies who sit in their bedrooms, Snapchat storying, all those friends, like was exampled here, they have got time. If they have time, it's because they're not really doing the homework. It's because they're not really being coveted by their parents. It's because they're not really being given interest groups that they can attend that give them a whole different sense of, set of scenarios about who they are. It's something about neglect in their world. And when you start seeing it from that perspective, you can't really be angry with them because they're already missing something really symbolic in their world. So my job is to help people see that we're talking about the same issue across the board. 
We're talking about kids and feelings and not knowing how to manage those feelings. And we're talking about a system right now that gives access to people mismanaging those feelings. But in the long term, it's also something that's magnificent in its own right. Cyberbullying exists because nowadays, if you're a gay kid living in the Neath Valley, who's literally the only gay in the village, that's okay. So it exists for the same reason as that. And so I have to draw the more positive aspects of that. You know, I have to take it back to when I worked my first trans man, when I was a 23 year old practitioner, and that individual thought that there was something critically wrong with who he was. And now he would just have realized that he was in the wrong gender. That's what the beauty of the digital age is about. And we cannot be afraid of it. We have to embrace it. One of the most important and powerful lessons that I've had is I started getting rid of my arrogant, I know everything professional streak. And I started listening. I started spending time with kids, all different ages. Sounds a bit wrong when I say it like that, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but I started spending time researching it. The digital area is really important for me. Healthy social networks are what I want to create, you know? Healthy, healthy, happy social networks. So I figured that the worst thing that adults do is we forget that we're adults and even though we were children, we've kind of taken on all these little roles as we've gone through life. And in the end, we think we know what kids want. We think we know what they're doing, but we don't necessarily always see it from their perspectives. So I started sitting in groups of kids and watching them play online. I started looking at how they social network. I started learning all about boys' games and girls' games. And I started figuring out that the thing I feared was far less scary than I'd ever imagined. And in fact, one of the biggest mistakes that I'd made was I thought that it was fracturing communication, but it wasn't. It was just creating a whole new scenario for communication. It wasn't a disconnector, it's a reconnector. It was something that is much bigger than my initial fear. And it's more about how we manage it together. And I haven't got answers, you know, I mean, I have answers for certain things that you can ask me questions about, but I haven't got answers as far as, you know, how is this going to impact on our society in 100 years? You know, are children getting more depressed? Yes. Are we getting better at knowing that they're getting more depressed? Yes. Is it just that they know that we know they're more depressed, so we all understand it more? Yes. It's an impossible equation to explain and you know, solve. Are the, is the brain changing? Yes. We're seeing different developments in the brain. So we're watching that neurotransmitters, etc., are slightly different when it works with the cyber world, but that's good, because that's how our technology runs. So we have to get better to our brain has to get better. Are kids getting less attentive? Yes, you all know that. You've all been in the classroom. Kids used to be able to concentrate for like at least five minutes, now it's two, because that's what YouTube does. You're all at the forefront of that, but what will happen is we will change the system so the system accommodates it. We don't need to fear it, if that makes sense. And like I said, that isn't to make small of the harrowing experiences that people have talked about today. Everything that's been said I've experienced, you know, every person who's talked about the horrors of being bullied, I've lived that with students who harm, I've lived that with individuals who've been very badly affected by it. But at the same time, we can't change that from happening. We can't reinforce the fact that you're going to get a criminal record every time you say something awful to somebody. The system can't cope with it. It won't be tenable. You won't be able to punish people consistently for doing that. Otherwise, everybody on your street will be carted off at some time because of a misdemeanor. Because it's where it ends at that position. So all we can do is make it clear that to educate resilience in our children early on, to build resilient kids, to build loving kids, compassionate kids, kids that know that even if they've got a crappy, crappy home life, they're loved elsewhere. That's how we change it. And that's where we all have power. I don't feel helpless. I don't feel powerless. I don't feel that our society has come to the end. I think I am somehow living and conscious at the most exciting time of humanity. I am blown away by the possibilities of our generation. Blown away. I'm not scared. Yeah, things are going wrong. They've always gone wrong. Chaos creates change and growth. But every single person in this room, you've never chosen a better time to be born and to be working in the field that you're working because you make a difference to each and every life that you impact on. That's so powerful. And what's changed is that the web has stopped making things inaccessible. When I was a kid and I was working class and I was living in poverty, my mum and dad, they couldn't have a TV, <laughs> let alone the idea of the technology that's out there now. 
I didn't have anything to compare to because I couldn't get a bus anywhere because we didn't have money and that was okay because that was my experience. I couldn't get to the library to get my books out because it involved travel and it just wasn't possible. So the truth was that my education suffered because of access. The web is democratic, it's open to every one of our kids. Google exists, which means that even the child in the most deprived environment with no access to the opportunities that kids from Eton would once have had, they have them now. So we can't fear it, can we? We have to embrace it. We just have to teach our children how to not take it seriously, how to build resilience and self-esteem, how to ask for help when they require it, how to tell you that they're sad when their lives aren't very easy, and to remind them that they are loved, and to remind them that they are enough, even when they're struggling. That's, in my opinion, how we affect cyberbullying and how we change the face of our emotional experience with it. I'll stop for questions, because I know you've got other people coming on. I'd just like to say to Zara and Sophie, I think you're tremendous for coming on the stage. Um, I've been medically retired from Serious Crime Unit and I'm now going into schools to speak to Amazing. children. <laughs> Thank you. About social media because I've been personally affected so badly about what I have seen. I've seen thousands of images and the most impactive thing is for you two to get on the stage. I've dealt with countless victims and they've come to the stages of grooming and even at court they're still sat by me in the victim's room on social media checking what anyone else is saying about the case and it continues and I now go into schools and I will talk about discrimination, I will tell them that they can be prosecuted for harassment, I will tell them that if you take a photograph of yourself yeah. naked and you're under 18 you've committed an offence and it is impactive, you can see them recoil around the room as they start talking to each other but the most impactive thing for any of you to tell them really is if they're not bothered about criminal offence sometimes, it's the most impactful thing is it for it to be shared again on social, social media. Social shaming is the most powerful. Massive. And I think we know that from recently I'm a celebrity. You know, the children as young as years three and four when I spoke to them, they've known that that guy was not allowed back on because something shared for the years. of experience. Yeah, and talking about the digital footprint is so, so impactive. But I think in getting your parents there, the biggest thing I've sort of done is explaining to them it's not about the technology. Technology is a fear to adults. It's a fear to us. Yeah. You know, I had cybercrime unit that would sort the phones out for me. The biggest thing is to be able to tell them that you taught your kids to cross the road safely. You told your five-year-old off in front of you when they were nasty to another five-year-old. Just talk to them. Every day has to be cyber talk across the dinner table, and you need to have dinner together. And if you don't oh, have dinner together, together is brilliant. I mean, again, yeah. that, I mean, that's the ideal, isn't it? That's in the part of the family is at least two, three times a week. Absolutely. The only issue being that when you come from like dysfunctional families, where that just isn't a priority or a potential. It isn't. It isn't. But that doesn't stop them when I speak to them about having a chat about digital world. And if yeah. the parents on the social media, well, chat. What are you seeing on social media? Engage their child then with what is wrong with what that celeb is doing and seeing if they can bring that out into the real life. But it is just so, and even when I go and just speak to two, you know, small children, it has to now be as low as year two. Oh, you need to do it from day one. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, I do reception children as well, but year two and year six, you've got to bring in sexting. It's without a doubt, Sex year seven, it goes one. boom. And by that point, it is too late. And if you speak to parents of years five to tell them by year seven, they may be sharing an image of themselves because that's what everyone else does. It's, it's really, very impactive. And that's one of the things about funding, isn't it, though, as well? Because I think that every school would have that consistently occurring, like throughout on a daily basis, yeah. you know, along with meditation, along with all the things that can make children's, we know, can make children's experiences far better if there was a lot of money. And I think one of the issues that we've got as well is that it takes projects like yourself to be able to sort, sort those kind of things out, to go into schools and do it. The problem we've got is that lots of schools just can't do it, you know, for whatever reason. No, no they can't. They haven't got the background. And yeah. I'll have Teenagers stand up and argue with me, but I'll argue back with them. Their Snapchat picture may, I may think it just disappears, but who hasn't screenshot it? Well, I'll get a message, no, you weren't. Not if somebody else has taken a picture and there is apps out there. And it does work, but it's, it's getting them engaged in the first place. And that is yeah. so difficult for every school around here. And the funding available for everybody just is just negligible. negative. But the cost for the NHS and the cost of the mental health teams is astronomical yeah. compared to what they can put into schools exactly. to be able to help them and that frustrates me so much. It is frustrating, I think every teacher and head teacher and social worker feels exactly the same because everybody in this room knows exactly what needs to happen. Yeah. You know, we're talking about something, I can stand up here all day 
every single one of you is an expert. If you work with young people, if you work with children, you see it firsthand, and you know what will take the change. Yeah. But ha making it happen is a problem, and that's what the frustration is within all of our work, because Absolutely. you know what needs to change. And when it comes down to predators, I know you had a speech about safety earlier on, obviously, I mean, I've worked on projects where we've looked at how quickly it takes a paedophile to engage with somebody, and you're talking eight seconds. I worked on a project where we put a line where there was a 12-year-old girl posing as an 18-year-old on a site within five minutes she told people that she was actually 12 she took a picture because it's actually the law is that they have to be over 18 posing as a 12 year old obviously and i um, sent a picture of this very young 18 year old girl who was posing as a 12 year old and then we probably have 15 men sending really inappropriate material all that was passed over to the police but it gives you an example of how quick that can happen and obviously where the safety issues come from the same on games games are always considered safe for boys i myself had two incidents where predators tried to get in touch with my sons even though my sons are so educated because i talk to them all the time about it the truth was one of them was really starting to chip away it was like you know we're best friends you know you trust me more than anybody else i'm going to give you this if and it was taking time for my son to even negotiate that that could be a predator. He was just thinking, maybe I'll get, I don't know, some new outfit that I'm given if I get 9,000 points on this account. You know how it works. So, of course, we know that all exists as well. I and mean, you forget the cyberbullying. Cyber life is full of predators because the world is full of predators. You know, this isn't a cyber issue. This is a society issue. And that comes down again to who are the... Society needs to work in a way that it reaches the lowest of the low and the most broken of the broken. Yeah. It can't move at a pace where it looks after the fastest of the fast, the brightest of the bright, and the safest of the safe. Not that we're in a political debate here, but as a Labour person, <laughs> as a person who votes Labour, Labour, from my perspective, always works with the most broken of the broken, the lowest of the low, the people who are completely unreachable, they want to reach. So that's where I come from my whole time in education, and unfortunately I don't think that's where education right now is heading. I think it's about pushing, 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 and unfortunately what that does is also bury deep the people who already are struggling. And the reason that I love the cyber world is it's something that stops people being alienated. That is one thing that has happened that means that people connect. So I kind of really want to be valuable within that world as opposed to fear it. Does that make sense? I don't want to be afraid of something that's beautiful and broken. So in a school where we've got 73 different languages where quite a lot of the uh, families don't speak any English, I really, it really resonates with me to build resilience and, and loving yeah. students that come from, you know, I work in very deprived areas, so, um, and and so when you don't have the access to parents that that even can connect with you, yeah, can't communicate with you. And also, some communities operate from the we, not the I, as well. So we look at an egocentric perspective, which is actually more of a community perspective. So that's a different one as well. So yeah, no, just that I, I think school is a place where we, don't, we shouldn't have responsibility that we do. It's, it's ironic that education seems to be less funded, less valued, more pressurised, Exactly, and completely underpaid. I think we, we did actually a, a study a, a long time ago and um, looking at the impact of how, my sister's a teacher, she's been a teacher for 25 years, I adore, she's just a, she's a brilliant teacher, ruined by a system, sorry, um, she's just inspiring, she still loves the subject, she loves the students, she works with the very difficult and challenged children and she, she loves it. But um, we did a look at her kind of cost analysis, what would you be paid if you were paid in um, shall we say, a world in London working in the corporate sector, and it came out at £180,000 just for her stress level and the expectation um, that was on her. So you are yeah. underpaid, exactly. And the problem there is that you're all dealing with your own stresses and strains and having to meet the needs of children that have got a whole heap, a heap of problems outside of their lived experience in school. That's a lot to have to meet. And the reason that we have all these problems with phones is because children are carrying unhappiness and the MSPCC will talk about that in more detail if you go over and see him because what we see is that children don't know how to manage hopelessness. You know, we have children who are living in hopeless, helpless, broken, deprived, abused situations. One in six children will be sexually abused by the age of 18, 16 I should say. That's a huge amount of our society. Imagine that and extrapolate those figures just into your school. And then imagine being a child walking around with that pain. And then imagine seeing somebody that you can make feel pain. And then all of a sudden, that bully isn't really a nasty human being, it's a bully who's struggling. And I know that's not always the case, 
and then you get the jocks, the kids who just want to make people's lives a misery because A, B, C. But usually you explore the dynamics at home. They've got a father who's overpowering. They've got a mother who just tells them all the time that they're amazing. And actually that's setting in style a whole set of new problems that that child will experience. So everyone has a story. So that's how I explore all of these experiences. I always start with everyone has a story. Where does their story become a problem and how do I extrapolate that through their life so that they no longer have to attack others? Sorry, I'm being really gobby this morning. No, I um, I was just wondering, you're talking about this uh, about accessibility um, and having full access now, is there still any level of digital divide? As in, as in with people, yeah, of course, there are, there are children. It's like about 75% of children have got digital act, but 25% who have them will have it at school, ideally, if they're in school or on a project, if they're in a project like a piano or at the library at worst. But then again, of course, that takes a child going to the library. So you are absolutely right. There is still absolutely an issue with poverty and access. Ironically, though, in some of the poorest areas, they have the highest level of technology. So it's, it's a kind of, yeah. And then there are some parents who just don't let the kids have technology. Um, my children have to take a break from technology twice a week. It's as simple as that. My children have to eat with me three times a week. It's as simple as that. But I come from an environment where that was kind of my lifestyle growing up. I had parents who made me sit down. I've carried that on. It works for me. We are all products of our environments to some degree. So I best get going because otherwise I'm going to be knocking times off. Rob from Web Anywhere is now going to talk us through um, some security um, bits and bobs and uh, what schools can do. And I'm trying to get, get this right, GDPR as well. Hi everyone, I'm Rob. Um, I'm not a celebrity, I don't have a big social media presence. I don't really have any relevant experience to share with you about my own experiences online and being safe, but what I can hopefully talk a little bit about is some of the more technical aspects of this um, and you know I think with, with technology particularly when it comes to security safety and privacy there's a bit of this kind of elitist sort of you know I'm the tech guy I know everything you know and there can be a bit of fear from some people about asking questions so um, what I have done it'll come up in a second is um, I've just set up a, a very quick form where if you've got any technical questions or anything about security, safety and privacy, and you're a bit afraid about asking it, you know, it sounds like a stupid question, then um, you'll see a link in the corner. So just go to that and it's anonymous and you can just kind of ask your question and I'll have a look and respond to it here. But, um, <coughs> so, I mean, essentially, you know, being safe, secure, private online is a really difficult thing. You know, there's so many different tools, websites, resources that talk about this and, you know, it's a, it's a really challenging topic and the way I like to think about it is it's like a house. So, you know, in your house, privacy is things like your, your curtains. You know, at night you close your curtains because you want to be private. Security is all about the locks on your doors and your garage and your windows and things like that. But what's safety in this context? Well, this is what everyone else has been talking about. Safety is all about behaviours. So, how are you walking around the house? How are you locking your doors? When are you locking them? Are you locking them at all? Safety is all about context. So, that's a much more difficult subject. And that's you know, obviously what, what our other speakers have been talking about this morning. But when it comes to privacy and security, you know, there's all sorts of different things you can do. But again, it's all about context. You know, if I live in the Canadian wilderness, I probably don't lock the doors of my house. But if I live in East End London, I probably do. So it's all it's all contextualised, really. So you know, do, do we know enough to be able to help young people who look to us for advice on these matters? Um, so that's what I want to talk about. But yeah, you can see if you've got any questions, just um, in the top right there, you can ask. Um, and I'll have a look at them at the end and answer any of them that I can. So yeah, no, no one can know everything, they're going to look to us for that help, but it's, it's through things like this, you know, these events, the resources that we'll talk about, where kind of, you know, as the people that young people look to, we can sort of um, <laughs> kind of, you know, have these peer discussions and kind of learn from each other really, because no one will be an expert, but it's all about being able to find the answers and the help if we need to. 
So, no, I don't know the answers, but I'll try and help where I can. You know, my, my kind of top tips really uh, are about understanding privacy. So, you know, every single tool that we use has privacy controls. And these are all about, like the curtains in your house, your decision about what you share with other people. So whether that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, they've all got these controls. Unfortunately, there's no standard way that they represent them, so you have to kind of learn how they work, which can be a bit confusing, but there are lots of resources out there which we'll get onto later about how to control that. But the, the kind of fundamental thing here that we mentioned with this, this GDPR thing is who owns personal data? And that's what GDPR sets up. This is a new European regulation about data, and the kind of headline statement with it is, you as an individual own your personal data. And this is not something that's really been, a, uh, has had a kind of legal basis before, but this is saying that, you know, my name, my address, my phone number, this is all my data and I'm in control of it. So if I give that data to someone, I'm well within my rights to take that away again. So it sets up this kind of legal precedent to be able to and um, not only sort of give the control so that when you share data you can get that back, personal data, but also that there are fines that can be in place for businesses that misuse that personal data or don't control it to your wishes. So it's, it's a really important thing for, um, as we talk about educating young people, um, about how they should understand their identity, what that is, what that means, <coughs> that they own and are in control of that information. We'll get onto a little bit more about that later on. But yeah, the, the personal data about you and yourself is, yeah, it, it's a fundamental human right now under this EU law that you own your information, your personal data. <coughs> so next one when it comes to more on the behaviour side in terms of safety is, is understanding how to report inappropriate malicious content. So, um, we talked about some of the examples before of, of things that have happened to people online and social networks. You know, there are kind of two, um, two routes really to take with this. One is if it is um, illegal content, so if it is um, sexual abuse or sexual abuse images and content. SEOP, which is about child protection, and Internet Watch Foundation, which is about uh, websites and web content that is illegal. They are the best ways to report that. Um, if it's more about um, individual cases of things like cyberbullying or abuse, tools through social networking. So we talked about reporting things on Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter and Facebook. And one of the other speakers talked about, you know, why bother? Because they might just reply and say, okay, it's fine, just block them. Um, but a lot of these tech companies are coming under increasing pressure from the government to actually be transparent in the way that they deal with these incidents. So if we just kind of take this view that, uh, you know, we reported it, it didn't really do much, I'm not gonna do it again, then that kind of lets, lets them off, you know, but they have a duty of care if they're running these websites to, to deal with this. There's this quote from, from Alex Shaw MP saying that, basically what they've done in the past has been tokenistic and inadequate. It's just been a gesture like this we talked about, you know, you report it and say, it's okay, you can just block them, it's fine. They've been marking their own homework and they need to become more transparent, robust and accountable. So th there is a lot of pressure being put on these tech companies to deal with it. So, you know, if you or the young people that you work with do have these incidents, which I'm sure they will as we talked about, I urge you to report it so that at the very least these tech companies get an understanding of the <coughs> magnitude of the issue. Even if they're not doing anything about it, they can see how big of a problem it is. And that's everyone's duty to do that. So I'm not going to go into how you do that, but there are lots of resources available, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you just search for how to report, those are very visible resources. Um, Facebook do complicate it. This particular screen, if you scroll down, there's about 15 different options, whether you're reporting a page or a post or a message. The kind of universal language for reporting is this kind of red flag icon, but it's by no means kind of standard that everyone follows. And then the next one is really about understanding what, what people do. Um, I, I don't have kids, so I don't see on a day-to-day -day basis, but I've got a niece and I was around her house and she was on the iPad. I was like, oh, what are you doing? 
It's like, oh, Minecraft. I was like, oh, great, you know, I've heard of that, you know, you build things. Yeah, that makes sense. She wasn't playing Minecraft, she was just sat watching other people play Minecraft <laughs> on YouTube. Yeah. And this was about a four hour video, and she'd been sat there for a while. And it just never even entered my brain that this was something that people did, or young people did. So, you know, you've got the benefit of working with, with children day in, day out, so you will see more of this than, than me. But really, you know, they are doing things unexpected with the internet, things that we've never even dreamt of. And if we don't understand what they're doing, how can we help advise them on that? How can we support them? And how can we be aware of what dangers might be there as well? So, yeah, there's no silver bullet for, for this, but, you know, there are resources out there. Uh, the NSPCC worked with um, O2 and this uh, tool called NetAware, which has kind of got sort of 20, 30 different tools where it talks about how young people use them, kind of what their um, stance is on various things like sign up reporting, privacy settings, and so on. But ultimately, the best way is just to watch. Um, I think um, speaking before about how you, know, you just sit down with a group of kids when they're online and just just watch what they're doing and then kind of get involved and understand more about that. So we talk about resources. Um, you know, some of the best ones that, that I've seen and worked with in the past. Um, this is something that we mentioned the UK Council for Child Internet Safety, or UKIS. Um, this is, I'm going to use this word, I hate it. This is a framework for uh, equipping digital skills in young people. Now, you know, these frameworks, they're not necessarily something too prescriptive where you go through it, because it's about 55 pages long. But what it does really helpfully do is it sets up in these kind of key areas about self-image, online privacy, security, kind of what we should be engaging with students about at different ages and what we should be expecting them to, to kind of have as a skill level. So for example, we're looking at self-image and identity here. So it says for, for seven to 11 year olds, they should be able to explain what they mean by identity. So they should have a, an understanding of this concept of, of, of self and data, and then you have a presence online. Um, you know, I can explain ways in which I might change my identity depending on what I'm doing, like an avatar. You know, that's quite a complex concept for somebody very young to understand, but as they get older, they can understand how it presents a different image and what the consequences of that might be. So it's, it's really helpful to set this out so that, you know, if you're working with a young person and, you know, we don't expect somebody in early years to know about, you know, advanced security things, two-factor authentication, login codes and all this kind of stuff. But it, it does help kind of give that orientation that you might use then in other work that you do rather than using it as a, you know, as I said, a prescriptive framework to be really kind of like, you know, you, you've now turned seven years old, we need to do these things. Uh, we spoke about the NSPCC, and obviously we've got them, them here as well. This is uh, uh, one of the mentioned um, some of the resources here as well. So this is a share aware, which talks about uh, resources available for young people to understand more about the consequences of sharing online, um, but also for parents and, and people working with children how to start those conversations. So there are um, they call them icebreakers, which is kind of like emails that get sent out with kind of like starting points for conversations with young people. Um, but this is a really, really helpful and, and colourful, resourceful um, site to, uh, to look at. And the last one on the security side. Um, I could talk for hours about security, but it's, it, it's boring to start off with. Um, there's this guy here, have a word with yourself about cyber security. Um, you know, this is a site the HM government produced called CyberWare, which talks about um, Things like online fraud, security, passwords, um, how to keep your devices up to date. You know, back to the image of a house. You know, what what we we have the security, which is the locks on the doors. We have the privacy, which is the curtains. We decide how much we want to to share and, and uh, reveal to people. And we have safety, which is about the behaviours. You know, the, the behaviours and security are very closely linked together. You know, one example: my mother has never owned a computer. She got an iPhone about two, three years ago, and she got a Hotmail address. She calls me up and says, I'm, I'm having problems getting onto websites. I said, okay, you know, what, what, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm putting my email and my password in, but it's not working. I said, well, have you registered? She said, no. She's just going onto websites. 
that says enter your email and password. So she puts it in. But she's never even registered for that site. So that, you know, there are these things that we kind of take for granted about the way that people use technology. And, and doing this, this kind of approach where you know, you've got separate passwords for separate sites is a, a kind of grounding, really, so that you know, if one site gets compromised, that information isn't shared with other sites. Um, so there's some really helpful advice in there, but you know, if you've got any questions about security that are really troubling you, you know, resources like this can help, but also you know, feel free to ask any questions um, that I can help with. So, any questions from the room before I kind of wrap up? I'm going to have a look and see if anybody's used my, uh, my form, which <laughs> I won't be too disappointed if you haven't, don't worry. Can I, can I add your, to your list of really helpful places to go? Safe yeah, absolutely. Safer Internet Centre, Professionals Online Safety Help Desk. Um, it's, again, it's free, they work with a lot of the social media companies as well. Um, it's aimed at professionals, it's not for parents or children, but us as professionals. Just ring them up and they will help talk you through most incidents because they quote have seen it all before. Yeah. What's that called again, sir? Uh, Safer Internet Centre. Safer Internet Centre. Professionals Online Safety Help Desk. And Internet Matters is fabulous yeah. as well. And NSPCC, their help desk is brilliant. They're, they're all great, aren't they? Yeah. Can That's I thing with a lot of these resources where, you know, some companies just put them out there because they feel they've got a, a kind of corporate social responsibility, you know, they put up a page about safety and then they've ticked the box and that's their, that's their job done. But it's really through events like this where, you know, the people that are actually at the coalface, so to speak, can share their own experiences and tools they've used that is really the most useful thing. So, obviously during the networking bit after, um, after I've, I've spoken, please feel free to discuss and share any, any bits you've got. Yeah, so that was called SAFE, wasn't it? S-A-F-E. Yeah. yeah, by some of you yeah. Thanks. Hi, can I just add to your SEALT and your NSPCC and Internet Watch Foundation, fabulous to report everything to. As a police officer, I used to find that when we used to interview a defendant, I would say to them, you've been in contact with this child, and they invariably would say it was the first time I thought there were this. Please do get people who, are the kid that says, you know what, I'm not bothered, he's, he's this, he's that, I'm not going to report it because they weren't personally affected. It's really worth them still putting that report on. It takes a minute or two, but then I could then gain from CEOP that would gain every username and say, well, actually, you know, the same username four years ago, you were in touch and you did ask that boy for an image or you did ask that girl for an image. It's the building blocks to prosecution, and please use these resources. Just even as a teacher, you can report it. If a child says to you that they were called, it was called Mr. Unicorn 2, and he contacted me at this time, please do report it, because it is absolutely to get a prosecution through the court, and invariably a victim will be healed when that person is prosecuted, or the police just say, I believe you, and it really is helpful. And I guess it's, it's not just with, with kind of digital safeguarding, but any kind of um, you know, individual incident of, of kind of you know, abuse with a child. It, as a standalone incident, may not be significant to that person, but it, it represents a pattern of behaviour that can be. It does, it's you know, the building blocks, yeah. 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 Like I said, one more might be useful there. I don't know if you're not saying it, but the, you've got the TES now, 
uh, and resource from Anne Longfield, the Children's Commissioner. Talk about rights and understanding what your rights are around this stuff. There is a pact that talks about <coughs> terms and conditions of social media that is written for children at the age of 11 rather than the 150 pages that most companies write to, to blur it for us. And it's a really good place to start talking to each other about their rights online and understanding what they're signing up to. Um, again, it's just the teacher's pack with lesson plans and stuff in it. It's well worth a look at. Yeah, and I think along with that, you know, part of this new <laughs> EU data protection regulation is that any site that is um, targeted or available to children needs to explain how that site's privacy works in simple terms so that a child can understand. So, you know, this is something that's that's coming into force in, in May. So, for some sites, you know, this is already done. Um, one really great example of how privacy is uh, controlled is if you sign up for an account with the BBC. So it asks you, for example, what's your date of birth? But it doesn't just say that alone, it actually explains why they need that information, what they're going to use that information for, um, and for the same for all the other questions about like your name and, and, and postcode and things like that. So it's all about, you know, that by giving them that data, you understanding what they're going to do with it, and that's really important for young people as they start signing up for things and so on, to really appreciate that, you know, there is risk associated with sharing that information, but actually what it means and what they're going to do with it. So, um, yeah, that's really useful. Okay, anyone else? No? Well, thank you very much. So that just brings us to a close. Um, thanks again, everyone, that's for attending. Um, I hope you found it really useful to be able to go back to schools with kind of some best practice of what we've talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of speaking, Darren from the NSPCC is available to speak to you now. If you've got any questions and um, you want to learn how to have a conversation with a child that you feel might be getting bullied online, um, we've also got Smoothball and a product called Visago um, as well. Um, and obviously, I know a lot of you are Web Anywhere customers, so if you've got any kind of um, questions about your website, please feel free to contact somebody in the room that works Web Anywhere. Um, but again, just a big thank you for everyone for turning out, and I hope you found it a really useful event.